Welcome to a Prevent Connect podcast, where we explore the prevention of violence against women. This is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Hi, everyone. This is Tori Vandalin with Prevent Connect. On this podcast, we're joined by Dr. Zoe Peterson. Zoe Peterson is a clinical psychologist with a dual appointment at the Kinsey Institute and the Department of Counseling and Educational Psychology at Indiana University. She is also director of the Kinsey Institute's Sexual Assault Initiative. Dr. Peterson researches sexual consent, sexual assault, sexual coercion, and unwanted sex. She has studied men's and women's experiences as both victims and perpetrators of sexual aggression. Dr. Peterson is also a licensed psychologist with a particular interest in sex therapy, and she recently edited the Wiley Handbook of Sex Therapy. She is an associate editor of the Journal of Sex Research and was elected president of the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexuality for 2019 through 2021. On this podcast, Zoe and I discuss her research as well as others' research on perpetration and perpetration prevention. So Dr. Zoe Peterson, thank you so much for joining us on this Prevent Connect podcast. We love talking to folks who are prevention researchers, and I think the work that you are doing is really great. So. Before we get started, I would love if you could just um, briefly introduce yourself to our Prevent Connect audience. Sure. Um, So my name is Zoe Peterson, and I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm trained as a clinical psychologist, and I currently have a joint appointment at Indiana University in Bloomington um, as an associate professor of counseling and educational psychology and as an associate research scientist and director of the Sexual Assault Research Initiative at the Kinsey Institute. Um, And in general, my research has focused on uh, sexual consent and sexual assault. Um, I've researched both victims and perpetrators um, and really am just just moving into prevention research. So uh, just kind of have have gotten my toes wet in prevention research at this point. Great. Thank you for giving us that introduction. So we really wanted to reach out to you and have this conversation with you because we saw that you have some interesting research coming up on sexual violence perpetration prevention. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about your upcoming research on sexual violence perpetration prevention and maybe give us a little bit of the background research that that led you to this topic, both from you and from other authors. Yes, okay. So. So initially in my career, really most of my research was focused on victims' experiences of sexual assault, so how they conceptualized their experiences um, and how their different ways of thinking about the experience influenced how they coped with it. Um, But increasingly over time, I've really become interested in studying perpetrators because I think we we don't have a great understanding of perpetration, honestly, Um, and I think that ideally the ultimate goal is to uh, prevent people from perpetrating and so I think in order to do that um, we really need more information and knowledge about uh, kind of what motivates perpetrators. So when I first kind of moved into the research on uh, sexual assault perpetration a lot of the research that had been done on that point on perpetrators um, had really focused on characteristics of the perpetrators like Um, antisocial personality traits, psychopathic uh, traits, lack of empathy. Um, And and that research, uh, although it was somewhat limited, uh, it suggested that sexually aggressive men, um, and and almost all of this research has been done on men, uh, are on average a little bit higher in these types of traits than non-sexually aggressive men. Um, And I think those findings are bit discouraging when it comes to prevention uh, because those are traits that are very hard to change. Um, And so I think, you know, sort of over time, because there are these findings that on average, there's this kind of um, slightly higher antisocial kinds of traits among uh, perpetrators. Uh, A lot of people have kind of concluded that, that we can't change perpetrators, that there's sort of no point in trying to intervene around uh, perpetration. And so as a result, a lot of the the sexual assault prevention that's been done has focused on uh, teaching women risk avoidance strategies um, and on bystander intervention, so teaching other people to intervene to stop perpetration. And I think I think those efforts are incredibly important. And I think there's a lot of really valuable uh, interventions out there on on risk avoidance and on on bystander interventions. But but also, I didn't really want to give up on the idea of um, 
of trying to change potential perpetrators. And I do think if you sort of look at the entire picture of um, the correlates of sexual assault perpetration, there is reason to hope that we can change at least some of the perpetrators. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, for example, just in, in research in my lab, I think some of the correlates that we found of sexual assault perpetration um, are things like um, high anxiety, uh, which is something that we can intervene around. Mm -hmm. um, we've also found kind of some distorted sexual ideas, so ideas that, um, you know, uh, their sexual behavior is a really central part of their self-esteem and that sexual behavior is kind of the, the primary um, focus of their relationships. So these kind of uh, distorted sexual self-concepts, um, some people have called them. And in research in my lab and, and in other labs, uh, we've found that, you know, sort of holding particular gender stereotypes around, uh, around women and men's so the idea that, you know, men are always in the mood for sex, um, women are more passive, and women sometimes say no when they mean yes, these kind of beliefs are associated with perpetration. And so I think all of those are things that potentially could be changed. Um, and, and so it may be that we can't change all potential perpetrators, but there may be hope that we can intervene around um, some of these, these kind of risk factors, at least for some perpetrators. And so that's kind of the direction uh, that I'm thinking. I shall, I'll also say kind of related to this that um, it's also the case that many, um, not all by any means, but many of the men who perpetrate sexual assault are themselves victims of sexual abuse or, um, or adult sexual assault. And so I think, you know, often those of us in the prevention world think about these kind of separate categories of victims and perpetrators. Um, but in reality, those are overlapping uh, categories. Um, and so I think that that potentially paints a picture of some perpetrators as kind of more vulnerable um, and, and potentially able to change their behavior in some ways. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I really appreciate you bringing up the fact that perpetration prevention is a piece of holistic sexual violence prevention, you had mentioned that we put so much onus on bystanders and on victims and survivors themselves. And I think what's really interesting about your research is that you are looking at those changeable, those intervenable, those preventable characteristics when we're looking at perpetration. And I think that's what we're all about with primary perpetration, right? We're trying to, or with primary prevention, excuse me that's what we're all about with primary prevention. We're trying to prevent perpetration from happening in the first place. But in order to do that, we need to know what are the characteristics of folks who perpetrate? How can we intervene in them? And when we're kind of just stuck with what you had talked about before, where a lot of the previous research focuses on um, identifying perpetrators as those who are antisocial and things like that, that are really hard to to intervene with, I think it's really incredible that your research is looking more at, okay, so what can we actually change? And I think that's going to have, when we see results, when we hear more of the research and the, and the published findings, I think that's really going to, going to change how folks approach perpetration prevention. Yes. Thanks. I, yeah, I appreciate that. And, and, and I do think, I mean, I think it's important to say that but there may also, well, there almost certainly are, you know, sort of multiple types of perpetrators, um, and 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 that some may be more amenable to change than others. But I think I just think we need more research to to kind of understand that and and where the the sort of pathways to change might be. Absolutely, prevention will never be something that's one size fits all, and that's a good thing. Mm. I think it'll it'll take a lot of different approaches for different behaviors and different strategies to create these cultures without violence that we're all working towards. Yeah, absolutely. So, and you can feel free to skip this question if you feel like you've already answered it, but I wanna know a little bit more about the research and theory behind your pilot project on researching perpetration prevention. Yes. So as I mentioned, I am I'm really just getting started in uh, prevention research. So uh, I, I've been that's sort of been on my mind my entire career. But as I said, like when I sort of started studying perpetrators, I just felt like 
wow, I would love to create this prevention program, but I feel like we don't know enough about perpetrators to design a program. Um, so, so the prevention piece is new to me. And so what I have done so far is this very small pilot project. Um, and so in this pilot project, what, what my colleagues and I did was that we created a mixed gender, uh, so it was aimed at all genders, um, sex education intervention. Um, and the intervention was really focused on sexual pleasure and sexual communication. Uh, we actually, in this intervention, did not explicitly discuss sexual assault or sexual coercion or even, uh, even really sexual consent. We didn't use that kind of terminology. Um, and instead, we really emphasized the importance of uh, sexual communication um, and talked about sexual communication as a pathway to sexual pleasure. So this was a sort of very sex positive uh, kind of approach. So we talked about how you have to talk to your partner to know what they like and to make sure that you're both having the best possible time. Um, and within the intervention, we also really tried to focus on undermining gender stereotypes about sexuality, which uh, there's some evidence potentially contributes to uh, to some of the sexual assaults that occur. So th there was a couple of different ideas um, that, that were behind this. Um, one is that um, as I said, there's this research on um, sort of um, some sexual, sexually distorted ideas and some problematic gender stereotypes among individuals who perpetrate sexual assault. Um, and so we thought potentially that, you know, addressing kind of general ideas about communication, undermining uh, gender stereotypes might be useful in preventing uh, sexual aggression. But the other reason, the reason we took this very sex positive approach and the reason we actually made this a mixed gender uh, kind of intervention uh, is because um, I think there's some, some data to suggest that most interventions that are aimed at potential perpetrators, and so usually these are interventions that are delivered to groups of just men, um, create kind of a sense of defense, defense, defensiveness, sorry, mm -hmm. try that. They create a sense of uh, defensiveness among men, uh, especially the men who probably most need the intervention. Um, so I suspect that even men who tend to be sexually aggressive don't tend to think about themselves as sexually aggressive. Um, and so when you uh, come at these men with um, you know, messages about rape prevention, they feel targeted, they feel attacked, um, and they also feel like it's not relevant to them because they don't view themselves as sexually aggressive. Uh, so this was sort of a way to disguise, in a way, um, some of the messages um, and couch them in terms of, you know, we're trying to, to help you have better sex, which is also a great goal, and, and if that happens, that's great too. Um, but also that then uh, that improves kind of uh, communication and undermines some gender stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that a lot of folks are realizing the power that holistic sexuality education and sex positivity has in our movement to end violence for the reasons you were just talking about, where when you address it from this positive, we're going to talk about how you all can communicate better to have more pleasurable sex kind of framework, that it helps people have their guard down a little bit too, especially, you know, being able to reach the folks that we want to reach the most. We want perpetrators to, or potential perpetrators to be in our prevention sessions and how do we get them there and lower some of that defensiveness. And I think a lot of folks are realizing that these holistic sexuality and sexual um, and excuse me, holistic sexuality and sex positive approaches are a really great way to achieve that. Yes, and I think you know I think one thing that we felt good about. So our our pilot was very small, and um, it it was a small number of participants, and we only did a one hour intervention. So I, I think this would need to be dramatically expanded in the future. But we we did find some evidence that it reduced some rape supportive attitudes. But the other thing we found is that participants universally liked it, um, which I think you don't find with all sexual assault prevention programming. Um, and so I think I think you're absolutely right. Like part of it is what will bring people in for the programming. And, um, and, and even if they're required to do programming, what will make them pay attention and be interested in it? Absolutely. Before I was in my role at Prevent Connect and Cal Casa, I was a sexual health educator on a university campus. 
And okay. yeah, so what we ended up having to do for, for some programs is, you know, some organizations would have a sexual violence program mandate, but they wouldn't be ready for the bystander intervention material. So they would send in me with the sexual health information first. And it's very similar content. <laughs> it's a very similar yeah. goal. But yeah, folks are a little bit more receptive to it sometimes. Yes. Yeah, that's so interesting. We Before we did our intervention, we did focus groups um, with college students on campus. And we asked them about their sex education experience. And, and what was interesting is that so often, like, sort of people's first formal sex education was often was often like rape prevention when they started college. Um, mm -hmm. And it does, like, it kind of feels like putting the cart before the horse. Like you haven't told them anything about healthy sexuality, but you're telling them how to, you know, not rape. Um, so it just, yeah, it felt like people lacked the basics to even, you know, take the messages from the sexual assault prevention in some cases. Right, and I think it, it kind of gives some weight to something that one of my mentors had said too was, you, when we're working in violence prevention, we can't dismantle one norm without putting in a positive replacement too. Like it's not just enough to say don't rape, but we also have to show people what the alternate healthy behavior is and promote that norm too. And I, so I think that's a, another huge strength of these sex positive approaches to violence prevention um, and yes, including sure. the fact that like this may be the first time that folks are ever talking about sex outside of their close peer groups and their their close family and their intimate relationships that they're talking about it in a bigger workshop setting. Um, yes. So starting with something like sexual violence prevention when maybe folks can't even identify what's healthy and unhealthy sexual behavior, that's huge. Yes, I think I think that's a great point. Yeah. So thank you for, for giving us more of that background. We're going to come back to some questions about um, sexual health and healthy sexuality and um, how it can help change community norms in a minute. Thanks for listening. Tune in to the next episode of this podcast where Zoe and I continue our conversation and discuss challenges with identifying and communicating about perpetration.